Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out another episode of the WeVA podcast. Today I'm here with Tuana Chelik, a developer advocate at DeepSet working on things like Haystack, and she's created an incredible Hugging Face Spaces demo of a Game of Thrones question answering bot, and I just really wanted to talk to her to understand this further, understand DeepSet, Haystack, and the things that they're working on. So Tuana, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So to kind of kick things off, could you tell me about the Game of Thrones uh, demonstration, uh, what went into it, the motivation, kind of these kinds of, these kinds of things? Sure. So the Game of Thrones um, demo is really a demo to display an extractive QA pipeline that you can very easily set up with Haystack. Um, so it's a very simple uh, demo. It uses in-memory document store, and the whole idea is really to 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 show people how you can set something up super quickly. And yeah, I've uh, Hugging Face Space has been around for not really long, but still quite a while. Um, and I really wanted my to get my hands on it. So this is what I came up with. So there are a few things I want to unpack with that. But first, could you tell me about the, the role of Haystack in it, the kind of the nodes and the pipelines and, and what that looks like for this? Sure. So I'll start off by talking a bit about DeepSet. So DeepSet is the company and we have a open source NLP framework and that is Haystack. Um, and what Haystack really is, it's a open source. Um, and the whole idea is to be able to quickly build an end to end, you know, production ready NLP application. So that could be question answering, that could be summarization, translation, a whole bunch of things. Um, and it comes on the, it, it's based on the idea of nodes and pipelines. So um, it gives you the fle flexibility to sort of uh, switch and sort of construct your own pipeline based on the task you want to achieve. So for me, in this scenario, I had an in-memory document store, and then I had a retriever, which would then, based on the query, you know, give the um, reader model or the question answering model um, the most relevant documents, and then a question answering model. Um, but yeah, so Haystack is based on this idea of being able to sort of um, like Lego blocks, build something up from scratch based on what you want to do. Yeah, that's super exciting. And I, I love that kind of retrieve and read decomposition. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the in-memory document store and how that might differ from other kind of uh, sort of like backend retrieval store options that are available? And I mean, with the plugin with WeVA, we can imagine with having the yeah. uh, like a vector database as the back end. Can you maybe explain further the difference between the in-memory thing and other options? So in-memory document store is basically what it says on the tin. It's an in-memory document store, so there's nothing fancy going on. Um, and it was the easiest to set up just to get, get going with. But you can imagine a scenario where you have lots and lots of documents li like residing somewhere, whether that be WeVA or open search or elastic search any other document store and then based on what those are you can also have more flexibility to then work with maybe vector representations of text data and which is going to make uh, finding similar documents to the query you ask a lot faster maybe so um, it's really about how efficient you want your system to be and where your documents were in the first place um, so in this example I didn't want to be bothered with connecting up anything else. So I just mm -hmm. went with an in-memory document store. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can imagine a scenario where I think we already even, um, we recorded a demo with Laura from Semi Technologies, your colleague actually, where mm -hmm. we use a uh, um document store with embeddings. So uh, with back to search um, with a question answering pipeline. Yeah, so I, so I really want to get back into the details of the question answering pipelines and uh, the different retrieval models, the extractive question answering these questions. But really quickly, could you could you tell me about Hugging Face Spaces and uh, kind of when you first saw it, did it like what kind of did it capture your attention right away? Like, how do you see this kind of Hugging Face Spaces platform? Hugging Face Spaces is I, I quite like it. I really like it, actually, because it's a <laughs> it's a really nice way to prototype and demo. Um, demo applications to people. Um, so I, yeah, I've, I've quite enjoyed it actually. There are two options mm -hmm. right now, as far as I know. So you can build an application with Streamlit or Gradio. So I built this one with Streamlit. It was very, you know, qu quite quick to get going with, to be honest. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a very nice way for you to be able to show code to people where, where it's not just pure code and they can mm. already start interacting with it and, you know, inspire people to like, this is what you can achieve mm -hmm. in, 
X many lines of code. Um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, and yeah, so it's nice to show people prototypes of certain very like um, isolated tasks. So in this one, we are doing question answering, hopefully. And I already have a PDF summarizer one, which I'm not super happy with the performance of, but it's still can, it's, it's great to be able to have an application giving people the idea of what you could achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the way that it lets you visualize it and then have a uh, user interface input output and yeah, Gradio streamlet, the way that they've simplified creating a front end for machine learning people, I think is just super powerful and exciting. And it also kind of has like a content platform flair to it where it has like the, uh, the news feed trending this week. It kind of, helps people discover other applications and maybe like integrate it with science and publications. And you, you know, you cite, please cite my work, you link to your paper with your demo. Yeah. And I, I think overall it's creating like more community, more engagement with the deep learning research crowd. But so, so transitioning from hugging face spaces, which I love and I'm happy that we're both excited about this. And I, you know, I, I'm really excited about the future of hugging face spaces. Uh, can we dive deeper into the question answering part of this? And I know um, DeepSet has a Roberta question answering model that's on Hugging Face, uh, the model hub, and it's uh, one of the most popular question answering models, I think, out there. Uh, can you tell me more about the question answering model that's used in the Game of Thrones demonstration and uh, generally your thoughts on uh, question answering? Uh, yes, so we do have quite a few question answering models um, by DeepSet on Hugging Face, actually. So Roberta Base Squad 2 is one of the most popular question answering models, but we also have what we now call distilled uh, versions of these models, which are way lighter, um, hence uh, a lot faster to work with as well, and still perform relatively, um, you know, comparably good to the original, the teacher model, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so these models are generally, they are um, trained on squad data sets, so question answer pairs, um, and the nice thing about this is um, where I feel like a lot of people don't realize this is how well pre-trained models can actually generalize to um, unseen domains. So we often get the question uh, with, from people who want to sort of start diving into question answering. So how, how long did it take for you to train your data, train your model on this? Let's say they see the Game mm. of Thrones one on the Game of Thrones data set. And mm. the answer to that is actually I didn't train a model at all. I use a pre-trained model, uh, question answering model, and these models are trained to look, search for answers, which is why we refer to question answering as a search task. They mm -hmm. are trained to search for answers in unseen data. So that was wow. how I was able to just take a pre-trained model off the shelf and use an in-memory document store, put all my Game of Thrones documents there, and basically told the model, this is all the documents I have this is what the retriever says are the most relevant to the question that was asked to, to me. Um, now, now look for the answer in these documents. Um, so, hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, it, that's incredible, the, the ability of these pre-trained models to do something like that. I, I never would have guessed, like I wouldn't have suspected that a question answering model would be able to adapt to all the domains like this, but it looks like this retrieve then read decomposition has offered a flexibility that is really exciting. And, and so the retrieval model also doesn't need to be fine tuned, right? Like it's um, a sentence transformer trained on like Wikipedia and it's a hugging face model. That part also doesn't need to be fine tuned or uh, specialized. I, yeah, I did not fine tune the, the sentence similarity model either. Um, I can imagine, you know, scenarios that maybe you might um, can't really think of one off the top of your head because what the retriever model is really doing is, or let, let's say what the retriever a component of the pipeline is doing is it's getting a question and it's saying, okay, I'm going to use a sentence similarity model to, to decide which documents in the document store are the most relevant for the reader model to even bother looking through. Because the, the challenge we have here, and this is where you guys get in, this is where <laughs> vector search and yeah, yeah, vector optimized databases get in, is that reader models, at the end of the day, they are limited by input. Mm. So, um, Imagine a re you're telling a reader model to let's let's say go through hundreds of documents. That's going to take a lot of time for it to decide what the most, you know, what the the best answer to to the question was. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to have a retriever before that, you can say, okay, you don't have to bother with the 100. You can bother with the first top five, top three, mm -hmm. uh, which the 
sentence similarity or the, the um, yeah, the retriever sets uh, step has decided is the most relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like that, uh, like going beyond 512 input tokens or maybe 1024 or things like sparse transformers. Do you see that as being a, a big limitation of this retrieve and read way of setting up the task? Or do you think we usually can fit enough information in that 512 token input window that, you know, it's not that big of a problem with, with a strong retriever, say? Um, in practice, it seems that's what doing quite well with a retriever mm -hmm. reader pipeline. Again, there are different types of retrievers, and this this isn't just about the trend, the um, model you decide, the sentence similarity model you decide to use. It's also about how efficient the document store you're using is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, document store like what you guys have, like Reviate, mm -hmm. where it's optimized for vectors. Um, is probably going to perform way better for vector search than another one. So there's a lot to consider, not just not just the models you use. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I'm kind of I'm thinking about this is inspiring my thinking about say the difference between large language models like GPT three, of course, and like the thinking around the in context learning, and then the comparison with the retrieve then read decomposition where. Uh, it seems like the retrieval model could be, you know, a, a pretty small model, like say 100 million parameters in the sentence transformer seems to be like around the range of most of these. And then the question answering, I think Roberta base is like 300 million, right? So you really uh, cut down the size of these models and achieve a similar performance. Uh, do you think a lot about that kind of large language models versus this retrieved and read decomposition? We actually use them both in combi combination. Combination hmm. is the right word, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I already mentioned briefly distilled models, but mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, we have, um, so for Roberta Bay Squad 2, for mm -hmm. example, we have a distilled model called Tiny Roberta Squad 2. Um, mm -hmm. This is a way smaller model. Don't quote me on any um, parameter mm -hmm. size. I'm not the most savvy about this type of stuff, but um, it is a distilled version of Roberta Base Squad 2, I believe, um, mm -hmm. which is way lighter than Roberta Base Squad 2. Um, and we know that it performs not as well, but nearly as well. So it becomes a question of give and take. Um, and we, when we do use Tiny Roberta Squad 2, we then also use it in combination with a retriever reader pipeline. Mm. Um, so, we're, yeah, we you can combine a lot of steps that we, that is going to make your whole question answering pipeline, let's say, way faster rather than picking one or the other um, to achieve an application that is sort of seamless and nice to interact with. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a fascinating idea that you could uh, have the knowledge distillation go from, say, like a 100 billion parameter language model all the way down into the question answering model and have interfaces for that knowledge distillation. I think that's a really interesting kind of area to explore further. Uh, I'm, another thing I'm curious about is, say, I think right now, the way that we mostly think about training or taking retrieve and reader models is uh, that we train them separately. We have our sentence transformer. It's trained to contrast neighboring paragraphs or next sentences, heuristics used to determine positives for that kind of contrastive similarity task. And then we train our question answering model like separately. What do you think about like the idea of joint training where you have like gradients, the gradients from the question answering go back into the retrieval model? You think that's maybe like unnecessary complexity, that kind of idea? I think they use that I think in this gets into the, to a branch of NLP that I don't consider myself to have the most knowledge about, <laughs> um, but I can imagine a scenario where um, maybe training both of them with an understanding of what domain it's going to be used in, um, mm -hmm. hand in hand, might make sense. So I can imagine. So we, even though I say these question answering models generalize quite well, there are obviously situations where you will want to consider training, or let's not even say training, maybe fine tuning of question answering mm -hmm. model to your domain. I can imagine that you would probably want to do that for a sentence similarity model as well. So if you decide you want to, let's say, do a question answering for, I think one of the ones that came up was biomedical data. Mm. Um, uh, would it make sense to also, in line with that, decide you're going to use a retriever? So maybe you should have a retriever um, with a sentence similarity model that's been trained for that purpose. 
I don't know. I think it might mm -hmm. it might make sense, but don't don't quote me on this. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the scientific text, and we recently published our WeVA podcast on scientific literature mining, and uh, I think what Kyle was saying is that the the vocabulary is so different, the terms are so different that you have such a domain shift that it it's hard for the Wikipedia trained books corpus yeah. trained models to get over there. So so on the topic of domain adaptation, domain transfer in NLP, uh, do you think there are some quick tools we can use to get a quick sense of what kind of degradation we might expect maybe like some kind of i've heard terms like semantic drift where maybe you look at certain tokens that have like a totally different meaning in some other corpus or maybe you look at like the tokenizer mismatch like uh certain words are being mapped to the unknown token and you just lose information do you think there's maybe a way to get a quick sense of domain adaptation as we're like building yeah i would as a haystack person i would say why not try fine-tuning a model uh, to your data and then evaluating your model. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you can you can do a lot of these via with Haystack too. Um, so I would say uh, go for it, have an evaluation set and see how it performs for you. Uh, on this topic of fine tuning, uh, like sentence transformers. So is fine tuning something that's built into the Haystack suite sort of? Is, can you tell yeah. me more about how that works? Yeah, so you can, yeah, you can, um, you can download a model straight from Hugging Face. Haystack has a Hugging Face um, integration. Mm -hmm. um, and then say, OK, now continue training for X many epochs with my, my data set, where, where, which is at this location. Hmm. Um, it's actually, I think it's on the Haystack documentation. It's uh, a surprisingly easy process. I did it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that different from, um, so is that for training the retriever models or the reader models? This is, this is for the reader model that I'm talking about. This is for the question answering model. I think that's the most common mm -hmm. um, place where you would want to fine tune a model. So is that fine tuning it with the retrieval attached to it? So it kind of gets no, used to having... This is, this is just, so the, the reader model, like, like you mentioned before, is a totally separate entity mm -hmm. to the to the retriever so the only thing that the reader really cares about is i've got this context this bit of text somewhere mm -hmm. and i have just received a question and i'm going to look through this bit of text to find an answer for it whether right. it gets that bit of text from a retriever or whether you input it via the hugging face inference api mm -hmm. for example it doesn't care mm -hmm. do, do you think maybe there's something to adapting the question answering models to I mean, I think like with squad, right, it's already trained with the uh, context, like what is the atomic number of oxygen? It gets a paragraph from Wikipedia as a part of the input. Do you think maybe fine tuning it with the kind of noisy retrieval end where, you know, it might not, it might give you that paragraph from Wikipedia, but it's also going to give you something about maybe like, I don't know, something about oxygen for underwater. I don't know, like some, like it might give you noisy context. Do you think maybe you should fine tune that reader to even if you're not putting gradients back to the retrieval, but like to get the reader used to, uh, like I have this kind of noisy, my sidekick here is kind of going to give me these funny results and maybe I can get used to it a little bit. But the, the point of, a, of the reader model isn't to know the answers to, to, to something. The, the point mm -hmm. of a reader model is really to find or search for the answers for something. So mm. um, it really is a matter of how how well can you how well can you deduce the answer from a given bit of context, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't see, like, as the point is to be able to look through unseen data, um, the, only, the only thing that it has to manage is to be able to be as good as possible at looking for the, the right answer. I think that's the best way to summarize it. It's like I, I um, described this uh, the other day um, as the following. So the question answering model is a thing, a thing, mm -hmm. anything that has been trained to do just that, look for mm -hmm. answers. Um, and what the retriever is doing or what providing a con bit of context in the Hugging Face a a P inference API is doing is literally just providing it with the playground that it should do that in or, or, mm -hmm. or you want it to do that in. <laughs> so, so this idea of um, question answering as search, I think that's very interesting. And I, 
I think kind of all these language tasks are kind of like very similar to me. Like it seems like question answering could encapsulate sort of the setup for any of these uh, tasks. If you phrase, you phrase any task into a question, like, uh, you know, it would say like fact verification, you'd say, do these claim, do this, does this evidence support this claim? Right. And, and now it's question answering. So do you think kind of all tasks could be mapped into question answering or maybe say language mm. modeling also? That's an interesting question, and I don't have a straight answer for it, but it is an, it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about it. Um, the reason why, well, actually, one thing that I should point out is that since the beginning of our chat, we've really been talking about question answering in the context of extractive question answering. We haven't mm. really been talking about generative question answering. The reason mm. why we call question answering search is, yes, yeah, simple, because the idea is that an extractive QA model looks for the answer, which means that it doesn't generate the answer. It also <laughs> means that you have it can only answer uh, a, a question if the answer exists in the playground you've provided it with. <laughs> um, now, whether everything else can be described as a question answering task, um, that's a tricky one, because then I'm thinking about a lot of other uh, a lot of other tasks in NLP in general. Summarization mm -hmm. is a question answering. I don't think so. Um, um, but yeah. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that up, the extractive versus abstractive thing. And and um, maybe like as kind of a quick thing, I think maybe the ex extractive models are much more like ready for these kind of production systems like, you know, Haystack, Weavia, as we build these tools that we're trying to push into like a more like a software engineering crowd. I feel like the extractive models, I feel like they make a lot more sense. You can debug them a lot easier, but then the abstractive models are so exciting and they have kind of hacks on them, like maybe like the beam search decoding or uh, recently a paper called rank gen. They, there's like kind of like strategies to make them more interpretable sort of, but like in, in your thinking, like, do you think extractive question, extractive models generally with classification labels compared to this idea where like, you're generating each prediction has a set of 30,000 possible things and you unroll that sequence like 50 times. Do you think that's maybe too grandiose for like the production systems that say a lot of these like open source, deep learning meets software engineering kind of companies are pushing out there? I would say so um, for a very simple reason. Um, the, the training process of a generative Bear in mind, I am not an NLP engineer. I've really been learning along the way, um, but this is my understanding. Uh, an extractive QA model is trained very differently to what a gener gen generative QA model would be trained as. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question of, oh, how long did it take for you to train your model to answer these questions? <laughs> that actually becomes very valid for, for generative QA models mm -hmm. because that this this time round, the model isn't. You're not giving the model data for it to search through. The, a generative model doesn't need context to search through. A generative model mm. is generating answers from the things it's been trained for. Now you can imagine in a scenario where you're a company, let's say, and you have all these bunches of documents, text data lying about, and you want to provide that via a question answering application on your website. Mm -hmm. You have two options. You either go with a uh, extractive uh, version and you use a model, either you use it pre-trained off the shelf or fine tune it to that data you have maybe if, if necessary, but then you just provide it in, a, you provide the data for it to search for answers in, in a document store and that data can grow. You still use that same model. If you're going for generative where there isn't a concept of searching through context for it to still be valid, in let's say five months time where you have all this new information, you're going to have to think mm -hmm. about growing and growing and growing that model. So in a real life scenario where you just want a simple question answering application somewhere, I, I from my experience so far, I would say an extractive QA model is going to be a lot, makes a lot more sense now. Obviously, I don't know, maybe in the mm -hmm. near future, hopefully we get mm -hmm. a lot more, a lot cooler things out there with generative models and everyone starts using it. But this is my understanding so far. 
Yeah, that reminded me of when uh, Malt from Haystack was also on the WeVA podcast. He gave me three reasons to favor Retrieve than Read that you reminded me of. And the first of which being that it's easier to update the models. And yes. I think that's such a compelling point. Like you need to update the language model to say like you want to change a fact or something like that. Or you, you're trying to just continue the autoregressive modeling task and it might not forget it. It's hard to say if it did. Right. And so that particular point of the ability to update definitely sounds very compelling. And then the two other things he mentioned was the interpretability of you see the context the reader model is using to predict. So that can help you out. Exactly. And that's another thing. And that's actually a really good point, because with an extractive QA model, you ask a question and you're not only getting the best answer the, the model can come up with, you're also getting information of where that answer was from. So hmm. in a case where, let's say, for documentation, where you have a question you, you want to ask um, and you get the answer, but you want to read more hmm. about it, now you know what document contains that answer and you can go and learn more about it. Actually, hmm. for this type of scenario, then even you can even imagine how not having the answer, but the relevant documents become very compelling too, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting the way that you can uh, see it. Of course, and, and yeah, like, I think they try to do things like, uh, they might do like some kind of signature in the training data to try to see what produced the generative language models output. Like, I think there's research like that, where they try mm -hmm. something like that. But surely it can't be as straightforward as this is with the retrieve and read kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And so then the third thing he had said was that it's, I think something that we've talked about a few times with distillation and sort of, is just that it's more like economical when you decompose a task, you don't need to store all the data and the parameters of the big language model. And, and then, yeah, you can have like hundred million parameter retriever, 300 million parameter reader rather than gigantic model that does everything. So I think that, that was a really great conversation and topics around question answering. And kind of the next topic I really want to ask you about is the uh, developer advocate role and creating content and things like that is something that I really care about a lot. And I'm really curious to see, hear your opinions on, on this whole process as well of kind of communicating what you're doing, the different mediums of doing so. Oh, man, that's such a big topic. Um, <laughs> so... I started uh, developer advocacy in 2020, actually. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, when I started for the first year and a bit, we were in um, pandemic <laughs> and <laughs> we had no live events, etc. So from moving mm -hmm. from now on, moving forward, um, one of my main things is really going to be like doing this, maybe doing it live as well, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. doing community calls and events. But my take on developer advocacy is that there are there are certain levels of it. There's there's one there's one thing of being um, trying to inf like educate developers on the tool you're a developer advocate for, and the way I've been doing that is like I said, I'm not an NLP engineer. I come from a deep learning background. This is more in computer vision, maybe, but hmm. um, it means that I have now entered a realm where I'm learning a lot every day. So we may listen back to this podcast, and there's something wrong I said, and I learn what what was supposed to be the right answer for example so my aim is going to be and i've started doing that i think i should be doing more is teach the community or like tell the community about what i've learned along the way so um, there's an aspect of educating people inspiring people to to, to start um, using certain tools or getting into certain areas um, and there's also the other aspect of making the tool that they're using more compelling for them to use, for example. Um, I feel like there's so many layers to developer advocacy. You can do so much with it. It's a social um, mm -hmm. role. It's a, it's a technical role. Um, but it's also, because of that, extremely flexible and very prone to, 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 to be a role where you can use your creativity a lot. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many different ways of packaging up the lessons you learn about how to use the software and trying to make it the mo in the most digestible format for your users or developers, people interested in seeing what you have. So I've been kind of thinking about like the flow of how these things connect. Like uh, one thing I really like is the Keras code examples, the deep learning framework, and they have like computer vision, natural language processing, and that kind of organization of the examples and, and they implement things. And it's very like, I, I think it's a very great way to get started. So I've been curious about how like maybe we V8 examples, we have our GitHub repository, how we could kind of get into that kind of organization where we have uh, use cases like uh, e-commerce or uh, 
an archive like scientific literature mining or legal or like the different kinds of like real world things and then maybe the applications like uh, search question answering fact verification like kind of sorting starting to look into the nuance of the task and that kind of thing so i've been kind of thinking about how you can maybe go from like github to youtube to medium substack like how these different kinds of like platforms flow together and i, and I think hugging face spaces is also emerging as one of these core content platforms for developer advocates do you, like do you think you'll view hugging or maybe even already view hugging face spaces as similar to github like in terms of the content platform for showing the code like what would you put more emphasis on i think i i view hugging face as a very important um medium for developer advocacy especially mm -hmm. in the world of ai and machine learning and nlp um for us for example at deepset hugging face is really the, the medium where we share our models we've trained with the NLP community and from now on also give them examples of how these models can be used with Haystack. Mm -hmm. GitHub is where we have our, our um, framework hosted, our uh, source code for uh, the Haystack framework hosted. Um, but I feel like hugging face, yes, and it is going to be more and more for me, uh, very it, like it, it's it's such an opportunity to to get to to the people who are every day interested in this particular branch of research who are interested in question answering or summarization or anything to do with NLP who would benefit from using haystack or deep set models but don't necessarily know of their existence yet but now with hugging face and the whole community vibe, let's say, around it, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to it is already a very important um, domain for me to get to those people. Mm -hmm. And one other question I want to ask about the uh, the Game of Thrones demo is: so you have you have such a tangible. Here's how you do something useful with Haystack, and you mentioned the idea of maybe having a live audience. How would you think about designing that kind of live presentation? Would it be very uh, like? what kind of data sets do you all have? Or or let's look at the Game of Thrones thing and really try to understand that. Actually, that's a very good question and on time as well, because in a week's time, I'll be doing this uh, in London at ODSC alongside you, actually. But I think you're doing it um, online, aren't you? Um, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually going to be using two demos there. Um, mm -hmm. One is a, is a different application. It's not the Game of Thrones one. Um, and it's a, a live Haystack demo, question answering demo about mm -hmm. um, world countries and cities and information about them, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I have to focus on one demo over the other or like focus on like the Game of Thrones data set specifically. It's more about um, displaying how semantic search mm -hmm. works and how that's different mm -hmm. different to keyword search, for example. So any live demo application where I can sort of portray to people um, how I just asked a question to this application mm -hmm. and clearly mm -hmm. it's returned an answer, but you can already see from the answer that it's got an understanding of what the mm -hmm. context was. It had a semantic understanding of what the sentence the answer was in was. Um, so it's more about that. It's not much mm -hmm. about the exact data. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it seems like it's, it seems like such a generalizable uh, pipeline, the retrieve and read kind of thing. Too, I think with with the Weaviate thing, and what caused me to think a little differently about it is where we have this kind of like class property schema setup where you can use cross references to say achieve, uh, like maybe it's like a scientific paper has author, and then you also have an embeddings for author, like you have an embedding set for the papers and an embedding set for the authors, and you can do mm -hmm. like multimodal. Yeah, like um, the kind of like hierarchical, like uh, take advantage of the structure of documents with that kind of thing. So I, I think that integration with structure is what makes it a little tough to just say, uh, like, here's the template that will work for your data set. I think it might require a little more like, OK, well, what kind of relations, what kind of like semantic ontologies, sort of that kind of thinking can we do in your data? And then how can we use that to build better vector indexes? I think that's maybe one thing that makes it hard to think about for me. Uh, Think about like a generalizable way to say here's Weaviate and here's how to use it for everything kind of like so but yeah 
Yeah. Uh, so one other topic I want to kind of come into is some of the things that are exciting you about NLP and the things that you're working on. Oh, man, um, that's a that's a big question. Um, I'm really mostly excited about, to be honest with you, a lot about what we've re- already talked about <laughs> is um, and it's a challenge for me. So I'm mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, I'm learning along the way. Um, to me, the interesting part right now is um, explaining to people who are not like people like me, maybe even mm-hmm. um, who maybe I'm a bit further than that right now, but who are not NLP savvy necessarily, but have been a part of this whole NLP and AI hype. Mm-hmm. And they are starting to want to understand and learn how this whole thing works. So mm-hmm. to me, the most exciting part right now is taking a step back and giving people the big picture like why do we have this retriever reader pipeline in the first place? What is the QA model actually doing? Um, and it's not it's not that easy explaining this to explaining this to people who are uh, interested. Um, it's really fun, but it's not an easy task. Um, mm. So right now, that's that's the main thing I'm focusing on. Is it so explaining it from scratch? From so is it explaining the retriever reader versus the let's build a massive end-to-end model kind of angle of it, or here's what a question answering it model is to begin with? Both of them. So because here's what a question answering model to begin with is a nice leeway to explain <laughs> why a retriever, why a retriever mm-hmm. step might be very useful. Um, the other thing, by the way, that is uh, quite exciting is um, long form question answering, which I'm still wrapping mm-hmm. my head around, which is a generative question, question answering, mm-hmm. um, uh, technique where uh, you you get basically long form answers and I haven't got my hands on it yet but we have it available in Haystack so this is another thing I'll try soon. <laughs> yeah, that the generative stuff is is really exciting. I definitely think there's like going to be a lot of opportunity with it. And uh, quickly, this is some, you quickly mentioned that you came from more of the computer vision background, and I also kind of had that background. So maybe I wanted to ask you about uh, retrieve and read in computer vision. Does it make sense in that context, where maybe for image classification, we're going to do a K and N search, and then similarly kind of reason <laughs> about the label given the additional context? I'm now imagining find <laughs> the uh, a stack of images where you say <laughs> find the I don't know red ball. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a retriever that gives you the first five images that it, that a ball might exist in. Um, yes, so computer vision was, um, I did my computer science bachelor's and master's at the University of Bristol, and my master's thesis was around computer vision. Um, so that's how um, my background mm-hmm. is in computer vision. Um, Super cool. Yeah, so do you, um, like, are you excited about, say, clip multimodal embeddings with image text and kind of seeing if this retrieve then read thing also kind of works in the multimodal embedding problems, like maybe visual question answering, uh, vision language navigation, trying to remember the image text, like uh, image captioning, those kinds of things. I think we actually have uh, a few people um, working on stuff similar to what you're describing, but don't quote me for it. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool seeing the... um, like all the different data domains and how I think language, to, like language to me seems to be, and I saw a really interesting paper where they were able to turn hyperparameter optimization into a language problem. And I, so I think lang- mm-hmm. in my view, language is the most powerful interface. Maybe that's a, a hot take, but I think like language, you can specify most tasks in language or use language to uh, specify the task you're trying to achieve and put it into the space somehow to get a better representation of things. Yes, I do think like I, I, I do I'm a quite a firm believer that we're going to start interacting with machines in general in a very different way to what we've been doing so far. And I think language is going to be one of the top things. It is already. Like even mm-hmm. even now, the every every single interaction we have with our machines, with our browsers, has some language aspect to it, natural language aspect to it. Um, and on the, t- on the topic of language and quest- and uh, images, how cool is it now we can like describe in human language what <laughs> art we want and we have models that can do that. How <laughs> insane is that? Yeah, the, the, the Dolly thing has been like 
truly insane to me. What what do you think about Dolly? I mean, I'm just having fun with it. <laughs> I'm just having fun with it, honestly. <laughs> um, but I, I'm really curious as, as to like how far we're going to go with this. Like, where, where, where's our peak when it comes yeah. to this sort of thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little afraid of the video models. Once you take Dolly and then it does videos and it can like generate all sorts of videos with that super realistic nature to it, that sounds to me like a little bit like, well, that's pretty crazy, deep fake, that kind of thing. Um, do you think there's, I, I saw this one criticism from Gary Marcus about like compositionality in Dolly where uh, the prompt is something like a red cube stacked on top of a blue sphere next to a yellow cylinder is some mm -hmm. <laughs> prompt like that. And it's unable to chain together these symbolic components like every time, I think. Like, I think because I've seen people also on Twitter put together crazy prompts like that and show, look, it did do it. So I think it's more so like, well, it just doesn't do it every time. So I think maybe this also, yeah, sorry. Um, I was just going to say is, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a generative model, isn't it? So, um, mm -hmm. but my view of it would be, I'm now curious, could you send this over to me after this podcast recording um, yeah, yeah, about the hopefully. criticism? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I like looking at this sort of stuff a bit like a Pollyanna view. It's like, this is just the beginning. Obviously, not, not mm -hmm. everything's going to work perfectly. But isn't it insane and quite really cool mm -hmm. that it can do, you know, these three things, for example, anyway, mm -hmm. you can imagine yeah. that in the future, it's those three things are going to be those 30 things. Yeah. yeah, that's my exact take, the thoughts on it too, that it can do these three things. And I think that's kind of like the state of deep learning generally right now. And and I think extractive question answering to come back to that is more solidly correct compared to the generative models where the generative models and deep learning, they're not, it's not like correct, like a symbolic algorithm and like traditional kind of software is. It's like, you know, it, it might amaze you or it might like totally fail. It seems to be the way to... <laughs> look at these things like <laughs> yep and i've also kind of seen that as i'm exploring the retrieval models i've kind of seen some cases that look like that too where if you look at the distribution of whether it returns the correct rank it's either one it got the exact thing or it's like 10 plus like it completely missed it and then and then you'll have like low density in two three four five for like evaluating the rank order so i think that kind of thing of it's either super correct and amazes you or it's completely wrong is maybe one way to think about the failure of deep learning models. So anyway, so I think we covered a really great uh, set of topics. Is there anything maybe that we missed out on Haystack and, uh, and question answering and any general topic? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I was just going to ask you, the last thing you said, was this about the retriever step? Yeah, like um, looking, I'm, I'm really interested in trying to you know, get my hands into the research of it and doing things like uh, uh, like the mean reciprocal rank recall, these kind of metrics to uh, look into the performance of the retrieval models. And really, I want to try to answer this question of off the shelf model versus fine tuned model and explore mm. that for scientific papers. I think the BEIR benchmark is one of the best ones out there that has, um, I think it's like, yeah, different different information sources like Wikipedia, books, maybe legal documents, and then different downstream tasks as well that are attached to them. Sort of like Wikipedia has fever. And I, I know I'm going all over the place for people listening to this, but there's also like um, knowledge intensive tasks where it's a bunch of downstream tasks that are built on top of Wikipedia. So this is a way of testing these retrieved and read pipelines for different kinds of downstream tasks using the same kind of information source. But yeah, so I'm, I'm really curious in just seeing the uh, retrieval performance in different domains. So the BEIR yeah, okay. benchmark is like the dream thing that I would like to get to. Just a side note about the retriever step being super accurate, like the top one mm -hmm. working out or the, you know, it's, or it's down <laughs> the, the number 10th ten, the number tenth <laughs> document that it retrieved. In a question answering <laughs> pipeline, really, if it was a top one, life would be <laughs> super easy because then you know the answer is in that one, right? <laughs> um, but the point of that retriever step in question answering is that somewhere in the top X that the question answering um, pipeline wanted you to retrieve model uh, retrieve documents from, somewhere mm -hmm. in those top X, the answer exists. So it doesn't, yeah, um, doesn't really matter that it's 
the first one, the third one, the tenth one. Um, it's just how well is it in putting it in that top X? <laughs> do you, what do you think about re-ranking the list based on the uh, the certainty of the answer classification? So it might be ranked position seven, but the question answering is like, I'm 96% sure that this is the answer. Whereas with the one through yeah. six, it was like 40%. You know, so like you can kind of correct the retrieval with the re-ranking of the. Uh, um, we actually have a, I think, either a tutorial or a demo or some some sort of um, demonstration of re-ranking documents based on which one could be maybe the most relevant to the query that was asked. Um, so that's definitely a use case. Um, but uh, in the context of um, a, a question answering model. Um, it's just received for for the question answering model. The only thing it cares about isn't the rank. It, it it's mm. totally about this is the amount of the or the amount of context I'm going to look through. It might mm -hmm. decide that the best answer to the question was at in the first document that was retrieved. It might decide it's in the seventh document it retrieved. It really doesn't care about the rank that it was given the context in. I think that's bringing us to another interesting point of whether you want to stack all of the retrieved uh, evidence as input. So it's like one big input, or if you want to run the question answering to each thing. And I think there's like the, uh, the fusion in decoder is what Facebook calls their model of um, separately taking each of the retrieved facts and then putting it in that like encoder decoder transformer kind of architecture where uh, you don't have the attention over all the facts at once that kind of difference where uh and, and by doing that you can have like a really massive list of facts compared to if you need to do the cross attention on the facts yeah this is where we get into a whole other a whole <laughs> other topic based on um the capacity the input capacity a, mm -hmm. a certain model has um right. yeah <laughs> well thank you so much Tuan. i really enjoyed this weva podcast and i learned so much i think this is such an exciting topic the retrieve and read pipelines thinking about uh, developer advocacy how to create kind of artifacts to demonstrate what we're learning, the different mediums like Hugging Face, GitHub, YouTube, <laughs> podcasting, and all these kinds of things. So thank you so much for coming on the WVA podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs>